This is a story about police corruption and police perjury in court. But the real question is why the police had to lie. The story starts in 2009 when I discovered my partner had been having an affair with a board director of the world's largest reinsurance company, a company called Guy Carpenter. After reporting the matter, shortly after that, City of London police used the counter-terrorism directorate who wasted over a million pounds on Operation Bohan to raid my home, my company offices, and also my accountant's company offices. After the big raids on my home, my office, and my accountants, um, I was brought here to Snow Hill Police Station, where I was unlawfully interviewed by Sergeant John Ellis and Detective Constable Colin, uh, Colin Dawson from the City of London Counter-Terrorism Directorate. The interview wasn't recorded, the officers made no notes, I wasn't cautioned or read my rights. Sergeant Ellis accused me of conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. The grounds for that uh, accusation were made because the forensics team had found on my computer an application form for me to become a magistrate. And from that, from that initial document, they tried to twist that and turn that and accuse me of conspiring to pervert the course of just, justice. Ellis wanted to know the names of the judges and the magistrates that I was bribing and colluding with. The interview took a sinister turn quite quickly. Sergeant Ellis lost his temper and was swearing, used abusive language, language that I described in court but I won't use on camera. In October 2009, things took a sinister turn. I was brought here to Snow Hill Police Station. I was then accused of, cons of, of conspiring to supply large quantities of Class A drugs. The premise for this accusation, again, if it wasn't so serious, would be laughable. Again, the police claimed that they'd found on my computer a photograph of me taking Class A drugs. I wanted to see the picture, as anyone would, that after being accused and sworn at and brutalised, the officers did admit the picture didn't exist. But what they did, what did they actually find on my computer? They found a photograph of my best man presentation at a wedding, which was a picture that was shown publicly to a lot of people. We'll show you the picture that the police said proved or provided evidence of conspiring to, to sell Class A drugs. I reported the matter to the IPCC, which is the Independent Police Complaints Commission, which has since transpired, has been completely discredited. The IPCC were ready to investigate the matter. However, they struggled at first because both Colin Dawson and Sergeant Ellis had amnesia. They had no recollection of my unlawful interview here at Snow Hill Police Station. It was only at a later stage in the interview that when I asked the IPCC to check the door locks internally, the door locks actually showed that the officers had accessed all the internal doors to take me through to the small room where they brutalized me. And now the officers had to give an account for their behavior. The two officers recovered from their amnesia and actually gave a completely fake account. The, the investigation was closed down and my complaint was not upheld. About three weeks after my unlawful interview, the Crown Prosecution uh, Service disclosed documents that showed very, very clearly that there had been a conspiracy between City of London Police and the global elite corporation, Kroll, which is the world's largest risk and private security company, that had been conspiring to create a case against me. The documents were quite explicit. The documents showed that in the first instance, my matter had been reported to Sussex Police, who confirmed that it was a civil matter and not a criminal matter. But Kroll, the elite security company, the email trail, showed that they met with Superin Detective Superintendent Steve Chandler and Detective Chief Inspector Jeff Davis, who confirmed that they would use considerable resources against me. The Kroll emails, again, are very explicit. The Kroll emails show that after they'd met with the police chiefs, that there were other emails internally where they were encouraging witnesses to lie, actually suggesting to them that if you do speak to the police, 
stress that you've suffered, alarm and distress. And that was directly a quote from the managing director of Kroll, Benedict Hamilton, to a potential witness. Another email from the managing director of Kroll, Benedict Hamilton, said that I posed no serious risk or threat. However, they were keeping their options as to whether to push the police to prosecute me or to take out a civil remedy. And where there's a civil remedy, no criminal prosecutions should take place if no criminal actions have occurred. A very telling email from the managing director of Kroll, Benedict Hamilton, shows that they were weighing their options up as to how they could use the police to further the prosecution or a potential prosecution against me, but using police resources. Another important part of the police's prosecution evidence against me that wasn't used in court, but was used by us, the defense, was the unlawful interview of my partner. At the time, she was interviewed by City of London Police for over an hour and was accused of conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. The detective actually accused her of making up the affair and actually said that she'd made the whole thing up. Now, whether we had or we hadn't, what are counter-terrorism directorate officers investigating such a nonsense matter for? That's a much more relevant question. However, this is where it becomes more sinister. When we applied to City of London Police to ask who had actually carried out the interview, who, had all, who was the name of the officer, who had authorised the interview, on what grounds, City of London Police confirmed that they had no record or any evidence that this interview had ever taken place. The only evidence that the interview had taken place, naming the actual officer from City of London Police, were, were internal Kroll emails that showed that Dan Mead, the head of security at Kroll, and Ian Fat, the head of security at Guy Carpenter, had liaised directly with City of London Police and organised for City of London Police to interview my partner. A sinister email that was again disclosed by the Crown Prosecution Service is an internal Kroll email, again from the managing director of Kroll, who was taking care of the Kroll case against me. It shows, as you'll see from the email, that they wanted to remain hidden and out of view in their influence on this whole prosecution case against me. For anyone that's been following my case and the case of counter-terrorist operation Bohan against me will know that I was prosecuted for creating my website policeexpenses.co.uk which publicised and exposed the extreme abuse of power and the conspiracy by Kroll and City of London Police against me. At trial, I was able to give a very detailed account of what the officers did to me here at Snow Hill Police Station in October 2009. The judge was absolutely appalled at what I had to say and actually adjourned the, adjourned the case for an hour and demanded that the two officers, both Ellis and Dawson, were called or summoned to court within an hour to give an account. Colin Dawson first took the witness box and was questioned by Michael Walkine QC. Throughout the whole of the cross-examination, Dawson maintained that he still had amnesia and had no recollection of the original interview here in October 2009. But we now get to Sergeant John Ellis, who was now under cross-examination. At trial, Sergeant Ellis is then called to give an account for what he did to me during this unlawful interview at Snow Hill Police Station. Interestingly, this is why City of London Police had to lie. Now at trial, Sergeant John Ellis is called to give an account and Sergeant Ellis is put in the witness box and is cross-examined by Michael Walkind QC. Michael Walkind asked, asked Sergeant Ellis, how many people were searching my property? Ellis feigned amnesia and said it was maybe one or two, but couldn't quite recollect. He didn't make any notes. Under cross-examination, we got the numbers up significantly, and there was a large search team searching my property, my company offices, and my company accountants. Sergeant Ellis then, under cross-examination, proclaimed that it was a very, very important interview 
that was had here in October 2009. He was asked why by Michael Wolkind. A Sergeant Ellis said that he found during the search large quantities of Class A drugs in my kitchen, in my bedroom, and in my loft room. Michael Wolkind QC then asked Sergeant Ellis what he'd done with them. Did he confiscate them? Yes or no? Sergeant Ellis said no. Michael Wolkind said, but you made a note of this large cache of Class A drugs in your notebook. Yes or no? Sergeant Ellis said no. But Michael Wolkind said, but surely you discussed this with the other fellow officers during the search. You found them in the kitchen, you found them in the bedroom, you found them in the loft room. You had three occasions to, to discuss with your fellow officers on the search this large cache of Class A drugs. Sergeant Ellis said, no, he didn't, he didn't mention that to them at all. Michael Wolkind then said, but you rang your boss and said, Gav, 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 we've got him. We found a large cache of crack cocaine. You made that call to your boss though, didn't you? Surely, yes or no? And Sergeant Ellis said no. So he didn't make a note. He didn't discuss this with any of his colleagues. He didn't call his boss and he forgot to confiscate the Class A drugs. He was then asked, but did you confiscate anything from Mr. Puddock's property at all? He said, yes, we, just, we confiscated his satellite navigation system, a computer, a phone, and a laptop. He was asked, what did you do with the things that you sent away? He said he sent them to the high-tech crimes laboratory for forensic analysis in case they showed some evidence of criminality. He was asked when, when the satellite navigation system, my TomTom, -tom, was analysed, Presumably it, gave, it could give some evidence on alleged criminal places that I was visiting, behaviours, etc. But he was asked, did you get any evidence from that, yes or no, of alleged criminal misconduct? And Sergeant Ellis said no. So they took my computers but left all the Class A crack cocaine in my property. Anyone following this story or listening to me would not believe that our police service could be that corrupt and that unaccountable that to obtain information in, es in essence, in some instances, you would go to a third party, an American corporation, to get evidence of what the police were actually doing. Well, that has occurred in this case and that's why I made a huge fuss about it. The, the big issue is why would the police go to such lengths to commit perjury and to lie in evidence for really what was a very, very minor issue at best, or what Sussex police said was a civil matter, not a criminal matter. The answer lies in the communication between Kroll and City of London Police. Superintendent Steve Chandler promised Kroll, in writing, that he would devote considerable resources against me. And after deploying over a million pounds of public money and wasting valuable or scarce resources in investigating a very, a very petty matter. He'd kept his promise, but they hadn't found anything. Another officer, Detective Constable Sarah Mayer, who was in charge of the uh, case against me, admitted under cross-examination that there was no evidence against me to support the charge. The charge was creating a harassing website or blog. Under cross-examination, in the first instance, Sarah Mayo said that I put thousands of messages on Twitter and social media of a very harassing nature. Under cross-examination by Michael Wolkind, Sarah Mayo was asked one question, have you actually seen any evidence yourself to support that statement, yes or no? And she said no. She was then asked the second question, has anyone in the investigating team seen any evidence to support that statement? Yes or no? Sarah Mayo said no. She then admitted denying me my common law rights to a, to a, a defense of reasonableness on the grounds that it would have been disproportionate and unreasonable to have looked at any alibis that I produced or, stay, or stated in any investigations with the police. So at the end of the trial, why, did, why were the police forced to lie and commit perjury? Well, in essence, it's quite simple. Detective Superintendent Steve Chandler had promised Kroll 
that they would, he would devote considerable resources to investigating me, including the use of counter-terrorism directorates. After a million pounds of public money had been wasted on investigating and trying to prosecute me, the only way that they could show some kind of perceived, perceived substance to the investigation was at the last minute in trial when Sergeant Ellis said that he had visually seen large quantities of Class A drugs throughout my home, but he had forgotten to seize it or tell anybody else or follow any basic police procedures. Anyone watching this would feel, as I would had I not known the story, there is no smoke without fire, therefore the officer must have seen something. But in this case, it is a simple case of lies and perjury. For the avoidance of doubt, in spite of over a million pounds worth of taxpayers' money being invested in investigating in me, the police at no point produced any evidence against me directly or indirectly that showed any criminal misconduct. However, the BBC chose to report the police lies as fact and ignored all of the other evidence in the court case. Information, true or false, can be spread around the world in a keystroke. So he went online to discredit her former boss, Timothy Haynes, setting up fake websites to reveal his behaviour. We wrote directly to the BBC Home Affairs correspondent, Mr Guyton Portal, because we had some questions for him. We wanted to ask him why he reported the police lies as fact and ignored all of the other evidence that we produced in court. And the BBC is there to be impartial and also as journalists to hold power to account. Mr Guyton Portal refused to comment. I'm a small businessman and run a small company employing about 15 people. These police lies and partly the BBC's false reporting of my account today still continue to harm my business. Clients ask me about all these things that I'm alleged to have done and it's very difficult to look them in the eye and say it's completely untrue because if it hadn't happened to you, you wouldn't believe this. Channel 4 Dispatches correspondent Chris Plumley recently asked my barrister, Michael Wolkine QC, on the context, on the subject of police corruption in my case, was this just a matter of a few bad apples spoiling the barrel? The misconduct of the police in their investigation, in their interviewing, in their gathering of evidence and in their performance at trial was no surprise to me. Funnily enough, it was a surprise to Ian. And it's no surprise to me because unlike the public who may hear the headline case now and again, they don't see the day-to-day -day performance of police officers. Of course I'm willing to concede that there is the occasional good apple in the barrel. But what Ian saw was a shock to him and maybe a shock to many people. Thank you.